I just stick to my strengths. Look at the league. They don't pay people to play defense. To say that's a weakness, you can say that's everybody's weakness. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Um, we were going to be looking at quite a bit of stuff in today's show, talking about some summer league action, talking about free agency moves and trades in the NBA offseason, rotation issues, all that sort of stuff with, of course, my basketball monster uh, colleague, Kyle McKeown. But uh, in the uh, time since uh, recording the last podcast, Kawhi Leonard has, of course, been traded. So we're going to be talking about that. We'll talk about some of the other stuff, um, and then we'll probably get Kyle back uh, later on for another show to go through the rest of the stuff, because there is a ton for us to talk about. But why wait? Why waste any more time? Because now it is time for me to bring in my basketball monster colleague, Kyle McEwen. I love you guys, except for you, Kyle. <laughs> that's awesome. That's uh, that's the first, first time I've ever had a drop on here. That's uh, I'm loving it. Yeah, it took me a while to find a good one. Um, I had a few people suggest, including yourself, that to do something involving South Park, but I couldn't find the right one. And then uh, they come out with that one. I'm, I'm pretty happy with how it uh, with how it turned out. But uh, of course, I love you as well, Kyle. Not uh, don't take oh. Hartman's words to heart. I, I never would. I, I don't question where your heart lies, Josh. Exactly. That's how that's how it should be for everybody. All right, so Kyle, we have got lots to talk about. We, you sent me through a list of all the stuff you wanted to talk about. Then, of course, uh, Shams decides at 2 a.m. Eastern to start dropping bombs on us about uh, Kawhi Leonard in, in serious discussions. And as soon as Shams says it's serious, and then Woj, someone, uh, someone pokes Woj and says, mate, you better get up because Shams is all over this. And he says it's in serious discussions. You know something's going to go down. And, of course, it was official while I was asleep. The parameters of the deal with Kawhi Leonard heading to the Toronto Raptors for DeMar DeRozan. We had that happen uh, initially. We saw uh, that was the initial reporting and then uh, some extra players involved there. I always thought that Pirtle and perhaps OG Ananobi, the Jedi, would be one of those guys who, who moved across. It turned out not to be OG. It was just Jakob Pirtle along with DeMar DeRozan and a top 20 protected 2019 first round pick. That went to San Antonio while the Spurs sent Kawhi Leonard and Danny Green to Toronto. Um, Kai, when we were seeing all this Kawhi stuff last season, did you actually think this was going to be a possibility? Um, not really, because we didn't know until closer to the end of the end of the regular season or the off season that there was legitimate concerns with Kawhi's mental situation in, in with the Spurs. We we were led to believe, like everybody was, that there was a legitimate injury issue all last season, and maybe that's still the case to some degree. But we know that there was ac between the teams. We know that some of the, the that acrimony or that frustration between Kawhi and the Spurs and the Spurs and Kawhi was also uh, embroiled further by the fact that certain teammates were questioning whether or not Kawhi was injured last year in regards to what Tony Parker said about how they had the same injury, yet Tony said his injury was 100 times worse than Kawhi's was in the near the end of last season or kind of in the middle there. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to have a resolution. Although, um, I think this trade left people wanting on, um, maybe, maybe on both sides. I think the, the thing is it's weird with this trade is that Kawhi from all reporting doesn't want to go to Toronto. DeMar DeRozan is clearly pissed after apparently being told at Vegas summer league that he won't be traded. And then yeah, went to summer league again yesterday, and then he's traded uh, a, a day later to the Spurs. He doesn't want to leave. He has made significant commitments to Toronto by all accounts. He's a, he's a ripper bloke, does a ton in the community, and has fully embraced living in Toronto and being the franchise player for that team. Of course, he can give whatever bullshit of, yeah, it's a business, all that sort of stuff, and, oh, he makes millions of dollars. How can he be sad? There's still personal issues. There's still family issues. We know that DeMar had been dealing with mental health problems, and he came out about that last season, and he was rightly applauded for that. So this is not a great thing for him. Raptors fan base love DeMar DeRozan. There's a lot of concern with Kawhi Leonard and his mental state, not from a, a mental health issue necessarily, but from a where is he? Is he going to you know, 
play at at full capacity does he is he just gonna you know piss and moan all season about not wanting to be in toronto the uh, raptors fans have already got a little bit of their back up the majority that i've seen anyway but oh bloody Kawhi, he doesn't even want to be here while we trade away this franchise corner piece now i don't think anyone can debate kyle that that uh, Kawhi leonard a healthy Kawhi leonard is a better player than demar Derozan. i don't think there's really too much of a debate there and you can say yeah demar did all, all what he did offensively Kawhi can do that and you can also do it defensively and then you bring in another great perimeter defender in danny green Green. Um, so I think almost undoubtedly the Raptors get better, but I understand the hesitation and the reservation from Raptors fans about how all this went down, especially if Kawhi, as he says, is just going to bolt after the end of the season. Yeah, no, all, all good points. Um, it's it's amazing to me that Toronto was able to get back Danny Green as a part of this trade too, just because he's a, even though he's older than what a lot of people think, Danny Green's still a legit contributor who you know is going to step in and start at shooting guard for for the Raptors, a starter-level player who's going to do the things that help you a lot in today's NBA in being a, a long-armed uh, wing defender who can also bang those threes when, you know, when he's not having his uh, time from time to time slumps. The other thing is, is the defense on this Toronto team. You look at Danny Green, Kawhi Leonard, Kyle Lowry, Serge Ibaka, who has dropped off, of course, in his defense, but he's still decent enough. OG Ananobi, Pascal Siakam, DeLon Wright, Fred Van Vliet's a pesky defender. There is a ton of excellent defenders. Jonas Valanciunas is not the greatest defender, but he showed some improvements last season. But they, if they want to run all defense lineups, they just put Ibaka at center. They could bring Bebe Noguera back to be their backup center as well, and he's an excellent defender. You play uh, Kawhi and OG at the three and the four combination, the defensive ability. And then you don't really lose out offensively because of what Kawhi does offensively, because of what Kyle Lowry does offensively. You've got Danny Green's three-point shooting. You've got uh, OG, I think, taking a big step forward offensively this season as well um, and then you can throw Valanciunas in there for 25 minutes of offensive uh, center bludgeoning work against uh, against especially Eastern Conference teams it's uh, it's a really interesting thing I think that they will be I think they would have to be the equal favorite at least with the Celtics for the number one seed in the Eastern Conference how would you have them at the moment I think that uh, odds have the Raptors as favorite for that one seed yeah, it's uh, adding Kawhi. He's now arguably the best player in the Eastern Conference. It's it's uh, him and Giannis. If, if he's healthy, um, I think he, I think it's him. Yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, if he's if Kawhi is the old Kawhi, it's obviously Kawhi um, because he was he's been in contention with LeBron for being the best player just because of the impacts that Kawhi makes on the defensive side of the ball. In addition to his you know, how his uh, offensive game had developed. How do you see the Raptors starting out this season with their starting lineup? Like, who do they push to the bench? Do we see Serge move to the bench? Do we see Jonas Valanciunas move to the bench? Does OG Ananobi move to the bench? Or do they just start off with Kawhi and OG at shooting guard and small forward and then move or bring Danny Green off the bench? I'm glad you asked this question because I've been thinking about it a lot. Uh, this is what I do when I wake up at four in the morning and see this trade go down. I think, shit, what's going to happen with this starting lineup? Because I know I'm going to have to talk about it. So I I think, and I'm not certain on this, I think they'll move Ibaka to the bench. I think that we'll go with a Lowry, Green, Leonard, and Anobi and Valanciunas at the five, but they could start a Barker at center. They could start Pascal Siakam at center. They could put Danny Green on the bench and start uh, DeLon Wright at the two as well. I don't think they'll go with Kawhi and uh, OG at the two and the three with a uh, Barker and Valanciunas. I'm not sure they'll go with that sort of a rep, but they could. You know, Kawhi could ostensibly play the three. He's probably better, oh, sorry, the two. He's probably better playing up at the four rather than playing down at the two. But I, I think they'll go Lowry, Green, Leonard Ananobi and Valanciunas with Ibaka coming off the bench. But they, there are so many lineup possibilities with this team. It, it's really, and you can talk about their playoff failures and, and LeBron owning them, all this sort of stuff. It, it's bloody scary, this team. Like there is, guys, there is nine, eight, nine deep players where you go, I feel pretty good about these guys out in the court and the combinations you can run with them. Uh, it's all going to come down to is uh, Kawhi Leonard going to be a, going to be a real dickhead about it or is he, if he's going to buy in, then this is a really, a really scary team. Yeah, and the fact that we've got a new coach up in Toronto and Nick Nurse, that further confuses what exactly yep. is going to happen. I mean, it was already a question mark on who was going to end up starting that center for this team. I, You know what? I, I won't say it won't happen. I do think Pascal Siakam starting that center is uh, 
I wouldn't put any money on that one. Um, and DeLon Wright, it feels like they'd want him to continue coming off the bench because you've got that, you've got another facilitator with uh, Fred Van Vliet. So just because it's, it almost would be a, uh, you just have too many ball handlers with DeLon Wright in the, in the starting lineup next to Lowry and Kawhi. Um, you kind of want the ball in their hands most of the time. Yeah, so I, I do think that it will be Danny Green starting in that spot. But again, they just have so many options. But in terms of when we look at this, Kyle, from a fantasy point of view, um, Kawhi Leonard, people are going to be scared off with drafting him. And I think it's going to cause him to, to slide. He was a guy that was a... You know, top five, top seven type of guy. I think you'll find him fall outside the top ten just because of concerns with the injury. What are uh, what are your early thoughts on that? Would you be willing to take that first round risk on Ka- Kawhi at this point? I really hope the Raptors let you know. I hope he passes the physical with the Raptors, and then the Raptors let him go and play in the uh, USA mini camp next week. Because if he does, that's going to alleviate a lot of well, pretty much any concerns that we have yep. with him being injured. And if Kawhi's not injured, then, yes, you can still anticipate a discount next year because there's going to be that 10% of people who are drafting who just say, you know what, it wasn't his injury that kept him out last year. It was his head, and it was his emotions. So if that's the narrative that they buy into, then, yeah, you might still see him falling to the end of the first round. Um you know, but we we had that issue last year, so it's it's hard not to at least put some validity or some uh, you know some weight in it to say there were people who were saying it's okay to draft Kawhi a little bit later, and there were some people who were saying you know what this is an instance where there's too much wealth at the end of the first round in the fantasy draft that I'm not going to risk passing up on a Demarcus Cousins to draft Kawhi Leonard, who's coming into the year with this weird quad injury that we really don't know crap about. He was a top seven guy his last two healthy seasons and played only 33 minutes per game in those. So you could make a reasonable argument that if he played up to 35 minutes, similar to what DeRozan and Lowry had done in previous stops in Toronto, of course, different coaching stuff, that he could push to be a top five player. Now, I'll throw some names out then, Kyle. Would you have him, would you take him over Jimmy Butler? Oh, sugar mom. Um... Most likely, yes. John Wall. Yes, absolutely. Nikola Jokic. That's a tough call because I I kind of consider Jokic as a he's just he's super consistent and um you know he's still growing as well mm-hmm. too. So to to know what Jokic has already provided and the the idea that he's going to have another year of growth, um, that's probably where you start to hem and haw over who who you need to who you're going to be taking there with those guys uh paul george (laughs) probably going Kawhi. yep i i think that once you get into the second round the start of the second round is probably where i would uh where I'd be looking at at Kawhi. I just want to touch on Jokic for a second because I saw someone tweet some absolute nonsense yesterday that uh, DeAndre Jordan's a better center than Nikola Jokic, which made me almost piss my pants. And they said that uh, Jokic tailed off at the end of last season, which again is as nonsense as it gets. And and then someone tweeted out his post All Star stats card. I'm not sure if you're aware of what Nikola Jokic did post All Star last season, but he's a he's a brief refresher. He averaged 22 points, 11 rebounds, six and a half assists. He shot 46% from three. 53% from the field uh, and averaged a blocker game and over a steal per game. That's uh, that's nonsense. Um, Paul Millsap was back for majority of that time. Yeah, Isaiah Thomas is around and, and we'll talk about the Nuggets a little bit later, but those sort of numbers are crazy. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd take Kawhi over Jokic, but I would over those other guys that we mentioned, Butler and George and uh, and Johnny Wall. And as soon as he slides into that, uh, well, how, here's one. How about... Um, I don't think that I, I Le, LeBron's almost underrated right now, mm. even at 33. Just be, and, you know, he's going to a sh- a crap Lakers team that he's going to have to do everything. He's probably going to want to play every night, just like he did last year, just to make sure that they're in a as good of a position for the playoffs as they can be. Um, and I don't think LeBron realizes how much him getting into the free agency meddling with signing off on Rondo and Lance Stevenson and JaVel McGee as his boys, I don't think he realizes how much trouble he's in unless 
Luke Walton can mitigate that disaster by playing the right guys. Yeah, it's, it is going to be an interesting uh, experience there for the Lakers. And now for the on the Spurs side of things, Kyle DeMar DeRozan and Jakob Pert will come across. I imagine DeRozan's value will be fairly similar. Maybe he sees a, f- a, f- a couple of fewer minutes in San Antonio. But the one I think that gets the biggest bump there is Jakob Pertl. At the moment, the, the Spurs front, well, the Spurs wings are an absolute disaster at this point. I don't know. You, you asked me who I think the Raptors starting lineup will be. What do you think the Spurs starting lineup is going to be? Because that, that looks like a disaster at the moment. Uh, I think you'll see a lot of the the mixing in the front court like we did last year, where you might see Pau Gasol start for a while. You might see Jakob Pertl start for a while. Um, the one thing Pertl gives the Spurs now is a legit rim protector or a staunch defender at center. And that's not to discount LaMarcus or even Powell at his advanced age, because those guys have done adequately in a lot of regards, especially when you just consider fantasy stats and things like that. But, um, uh, Pirtle is, I think poised to be, you know, whereas last year, what he averaged closer somewhere between 17 and 21 minutes on a given night, you're probably going to see closer to 24 minutes locked up or even, I think it's going to be a lot more of a split between Pau Gasol and Pirtle at that center spot. Uh, Davis pretends he probably just fills in almost, you know, exclusively at, at power forward, doesn't get many minutes as, as the backup center. Uh, Laverne's not there anymore. Correct. Correct. He, he took off. He went yeah. over to back to Europe. So, um, and, and Pirtle is the best defensive option. You know, he's better than any of those options that they had at center last year for protecting the rim. So, um, I, I like his fit there, but I'm not sure that he steps into a 26 to 30 minute roll. Um, I think it's still going to be in the mid, mid twenties. I think mid twenties, but I think mid twenties is almost enough for him to be a 65% field goal guy. Maybe average two blocks, maybe average a steal and grab eight rebounds. That's, that's valuable enough in, in fantasy leagues. If he gets to 30, I think he's a guaranteed top 100 guy. I don't think he's getting there. Um, but I think he, he's going to be fine to provide that. But we saw last year as the backup in Toronto that he had long, long stretches of having fantasy value just because of those high efficiency numbers and the uh, and the high block totals. And I think he'll be able to do that. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if he does you know, play significantly more minutes than Pau Gasol for this coming season. But at the, at the wing, they've got Rudy Gay, they got Marco Bellinelli. They got Brandon Paul, maybe. Like, who's playing at the three here? Gay's going to have to get a big uptick. Are they going to play Lonnie Walker, who I don't think is going to be a great fantasy option, who does very little apart from score and efficiency will be will be an issue there. Uh, DeRozan obviously slides in at, at the at the two. Um, Pat Mills is still around. Maybe they play DeRozan at the three and Mills at the two. I, I don't know. That, that backcourt slash three is a, is a real weird spot. I mean, does DeJounte Murray get rolled up to the three just because he has the length to be able to defend some guys there at, at certain points? Is, is that might be back? an option for him. Derek White, do they start him? He's 6'6". Six, six. Oh, they... man, Derek White had a great summer league. Um, and he looked he looked super legit, too, um, especially early in, in the early games that I was watching. Um, yeah, no, that's good. good point. You know, Patty's still there, and, and if they are going to get Lonnie Walker any minutes at all, um, it's... Um, I don't know, man. It's a it's a little it's a little depressing to look at the Spurs considering the the legacy that they've had over the last you know twenty five years or so to to kind of see what that roster is shaped up to be. It does say something that that in addition to DeRozan, the the Spurs bringing back or or getting back Jakob Pertl in this trade, the fact that they identified Pertl as the the prospect piece that they wanted in addition to Demar for. Kawhi I think that says something and maybe they do have bigger plans for Pirtle so everybody should definitely have his have him on there uh at least in sight as far as um somebody to potentially do more than what we would expect and that's not to say that we expect a you know a little bit from him we expect a decent amount from him next year here's a question with without notice the 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 young guys on the Spurs, DeJounte Murray, Derek White, Lonnie Walker, and Jakob Pertl, I'd say they're their four main, not key young pieces, but you know, you know what I'm trying to say. How would you rank those guys in terms of long-term fantasy upside if you were drafting in a dynasty format? You know, Murray, White, Walker, and Pertl, what order would you have those guys in? Murray would be first, yep. and then probably Pertl. Agree. And then... Um, and then Walker and White, it's kind of a toss-up because I don't want to put too much into the idea of what White did in Summer League being, 
you know, ultimately translatable to NBA or, or the NBA. And with Lonnie Walker, he's, I don't know. I don't know enough about his game and I don't, I don't want to say that either. I, I don't, I think there's still a lot we need to find out about Lonnie Walker. I don't, I don't think that he is definitively going to be a great player in the NBA. I think he has the talent to develop into a good player in the NBA, but he's also what six, four and Sip. that's going to only play at a, one or two positions in the NBA. And if you try to spell him further down the, down the, the, the depth chart, it's, um, I just don't see it playing out. Well, I agree with all that. Uh, that's that's exactly the way that I would have it. I'd probably have White a smidgen ahead of Walker at this point, but yeah, they're, they're fairly close. They are, I don't think there's much more we need to talk about with this Leonard trade. I think he is solid. DeRozan will be the same. Pirtle takes a jump up. Danny Green might actually play some more minutes in Toronto, but there are still options there uh, for him. Green was still a top 150 player last season, despite his inconsistencies and despite the minutes drop. So he's not going to be, a, he's far from a high upside guy, but he can still be that guy in deeper leagues that you use and you stream in for some of the those weird out of position defensive stats from a guard but Kyle there was also another trade that went down um, over the last day or so with the Memphis Grizzlies acquiring Garrett Temple and sending out Ben McLemore and Deontay Davis they also sent out cash they also sent out a 2021 second round pick I think Memphis has um, delusions as to how good they're going to be both McLemore and Davis were going to be off the books at the end of this season. Who knows in 2021 how good that second round pick's going to be because Marcus Sol will probably be off the team. Mike Conley will be uh, older at that point. That could be a high second round pick. All to get one year of 32-year-old overrated Garrett Temple who just honestly doesn't really do very much at all. I don't. What, what are they trying to do? Push for 34 wins? I don't. I don't get it. I don't get what they're doing. Just absorb. Ah. Yeah, it was a shit deal for Ben McLemore. Davis has got concentration and uh, IQ based issues. We know that. Write it out for one more year. I do not understand giving up cash and a draft pick to get one year of Garrett Temple at the age of 32, and he's not even that good. Well, they're paying Mike Conley so much that they're how good they are, or how bad they are kind of rides on whether or not Conley's Achilles is going to be healthy this year. And he's going to be able to play a lot of games and play at a high level. And if Conley plays a lot of games, plays at a high level, if Mark Gasol is good, you know, his usual self, um, I think they are intriguing because Kyle Anderson is a hell of a he's player yeah. on both sides of the ball. And I would like to see him have a higher usage rate or just be leaned on more for his ball handling ability and fac- facilitation. Um, the fact that, uh, you know, I love the way Jaron Jaron Jackson Jr. shoots the ball from three. He catches the ball high, and he doesn't. You know, you watch a guy like Henry Ellenson from the, the Pistons, and he's this six ten dude who, like, loads the shot up into his hips and then pushes it out. Whereas Jaron Jackson catches it high and just pushes from where he catches it. So there's this quick release. It's fluid. It's um. And it may look slightly awkward, but it goes in enough that and and at a, a good enough efficiency that you're just like, wow, this might be really interesting to see how how he goes in the NBA. Um, and I think Jaron Jackson starting next to Marcus Saul is huge. Kyle Anderson at the three, he's six ten himself, right? Six nine, six he's ten. Six nine, yeah. Garrett Temple sliding in at that shooting guard spot. He's got great size there to be a a good two way player to fit in. Who's somebody you can count on if nothing else to be adequate. Whereas, you know, Ben McLemore has just been a disappointment his whole career. Um, yeah, I don't know. I do. I actually think that the, 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 the main pieces there that we just talked about, those five are, are, are interesting and could make the Grizzlies interesting. I'm not totally sold on the things they've got off the bench there. So maybe they can find a way to add other pieces. I don't really know how they'll go about doing that, but, um, yeah, I think they're a little bit interesting, and 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 Mike Conley and Marcus All have have had such a um, productive career together as far as getting wins in in spite of the talent around them a lot of the time. That you know, it, you can't think that those fifty win seasons the the Grizzlies were having in the past were all because of Tony Allen, you know. So um, I don't know. I've got a little bit of uh, sneaky hope for them, and I guess I'm probably just way more of a Kyle Anderson lover than probably is even deserved. 
I love Kyle Anderson as well. I just, I'm just, I'm not convinced. But what you said is, is true about Gasol and Conley, you know, dragging this team. Uh, part of the other problem is that they've got a wet sock as a coach in JB Bickerstaff, and I'm not sure what he's going to be able to provide. And let's be clear, Garrett Temple, he might come in and start at the two. He is not a fantasy option. He'd need to play 51 minutes a night to be close to a top 100 guy, and he's clearly not going to be able to do that. They've also got the Brookses, Dylan Brooks, Marshawn Brooks, Wayne Selden there as well. They're all going to be battling for minutes at the two. Aaron Harrison, who um. Yeah, showed that he could be an NBA rotation caliber player uh, at some point last season. So there's a bunch of okay-ish type yeah. players there and no one going to stand out. So I yeah. think Temple's impact probably impacts Dylan Brooks and Marshawn Brooks' ability or Wayne Seldon's you know, uh, flyer type upside because they're all going to be cutting into each other's minutes. I do think Marshawn Brooks, uh, I'm interested to see what he can do if he has a, a decent size, you know, 23 minute roll off the bench next year or something like that or maybe even a little bit more or maybe they start Marshawn Brooks at at shooting guard Wayne Selden dude find out you know go vegan do whatever you got to do um uh, slaughter the goats to appease the gods uh but get healthy for next year man because that's it's so frustrating that every single time Wayne Selden gets an opportunity in the NBA so far in his career it seems to be derailed by um, you know, a, sh- a short stretch that leads to somebody else stepping on his minutes or him just being injured and, and losing the opportunity. Let's look at uh, just quickly on Marshawn Brooks. He played 28 minutes a game last year and averaged 20 points per game with 3.6 assists and 1.6 deals. L- let's be clear. He's not going to shoot 59% from three again. He's probably not going to be a 50% field goal shooter again. Uh, and he's unlikely to play 28 minutes per night or have a usage of 30%. So those numbers that he put up last season, they're just there's absolutely zero chance that he's going to be getting anywhere close to that efficiency-wise or volume-wise. So don't be looking at it and go, shit, he was the 18th player in a per-game basis. Yes, only seven games, but that stuff's not going to hold. The usage, the shooting, uh, even the steal rate, the assist rate, it's not going to hold when these other players are back. And now he has to battle the other Brooks and Selden and, uh, and and Temple, and he's just not and Harrison. He's just not going to get this level of, of playing time next season. So don't get overly excited by a, uh, a big performance from Marshawn Brooks, who, Kyle, amazingly, is 29 years of age and he's going to turn 30 at some point during the season. I don't think many people will realize just how old Marshawn Brooks actually is. I, I actually wasn't aware that he was uh, he was that old. He was picked in the 2011 draft, which again doesn't feel as right a, at all. As a beacon of light on a foggy shoreline, I just I do want to put a little bit of hope out there about the fact that Marshawn Brooks is 29. He's spent some time in China. He's more cultured. Uh, than he was when he was a younger kid, kind of doing what he wanted on the court instead of what was probably asked of him uh, with the Nets. And I am, a, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that he shot, 50, you said 59% from the field? 59% uh, from three. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Like, you know, <laughs> if he regresses to the mean, then uh, he it still might be really damn good. So To, to be yeah. fair to Brooksy, he did shoot at, some ridiculous percentages in China. And I know China is a much lower level league uh, and counting stats are always inflated. But when you're shooting at an efficient rate there, like it is still, efficiency is still the same. The level of defense you've, yeah. you've got it is not exactly the same, but it shows that he has become a more efficient shooter. I And I think he shot like 89% from the line in, in China too. I'm just so going like, to bring up his Chinese stats because uh, uh, you'd be surprised to know that I'm not completely all, all across the Chinese stats off the top of my head. Oh yeah, no. I, I mean, I'm. I, it was somewhere either like eighty nine point. It was eighty nine point seven percent or ninety two point three percent, something like that, from China. In his last three years in China, he shot eighty four, eighty two, and eighty one percent from the from the line. So yeah, not quite eighty. Oh, I was completely wrong. But he was he was over eighty. But he did shoot in those three years forty one, forty one, and forty one percent from three. So he has turned into a solid three point shooter. He's not a 50, 50, he's not a 60% three-point shooter, I know that much, but he could be a 40% three-point shooter. His overall field goal percentage in his three China years, 53, 50, 51. So the efficiency is clearly well up. You don't expect it to hold at that level over a full season, but you know, he's shown some significant improvements in his time over there uh, in China, even had a decent assist rate, but again, with, with Conley around, Gasol facilitating, Kyle Anderson facilitating, he's not gonna have the ball in his hands anywhere near as much as he did in China, or as much as he did for those final seven games of last season. So that was another trade that went down. I don't think we need to have pay any attention to Ben McLemore or Deontay Davis going back to Sacramento. But Kyle, what I do think it means 
is that we know that Dave Yeager was really, really loving the Dutch riders on Garrett Temple and would play him at every opportunity that he could. And now he doesn't have that opportunity. So what that means to me is we're going to see more Bogdan Bogdanovich at the three, more Buddy Heald at the two in combination with each other when that barely happened last season. So that could only be good things for both Buddy and for Bogdan's uh, value for, for next season um, with Darren Fox playing there at the one. I think that's a, a real positive sign in that regard. Yeah, what happens with Deontay Davis? Did uh did Jaeger love him in Memphis and now wanted no, him didn't, didn't play with him. the Kings? Didn't, oh, he, yeah, that's right. He, oh, didn't, shit. didn't play it. He's, and look, they've yeah. got like, this, this is the big men they've got. Randolph, Kufos, uh, Lebissier, Corley Stein, Harry Giles, Marvin Bagley, and now Deontay Davis as the seventh big man. He is getting cut. The interesting part of that trade is they sent one point, the Grizzlies sent $1.5 million in cash to Sacramento, which is the exact value of Deontay Davis's contract. So if they cut Deontay Davis, it's totally neutral for Sacramento. And that's exactly what I think they'll do. He is going to be their seventh big man, and he will just not see the court at all with uh, with all these other young and uh, young big men and uh, Jaeger favorites in front of him. He just, he just won't see the court. And... The talent's there for Davis. He just clearly is just not switched on, and it's been three years now, and it's uh, that's it's done for him. I'm uh, all my faith is uh, gone, unfortunately, for big old Deontay Davis. Um, let's do. I guess one- you probably didn't expect us to talk that much about the Grizzlies, did they? Hey, I'm sure that I didn't expect us to I'm talk sure, that much about the Grizzlies. I'm sure my large Memphis contingent of uh, listeners will be, uh, be appreciative of that. But let's talk one more thing now, Kyle, before we uh, put an end to this show and we'll come back and, uh, and do a little bit more a little bit later um, uh, for part two of this. The other transaction that did go down over the past uh, 24 to 48 hours was Trevion Graham joining the Brooklyn Nets. He was a guy that was a really strong three-point shooter for Charlotte. I'm not really sure why the Hornets... Um, rescinded his qualifying offer, perhaps because they have more faith in, in the Baconator, Dwayne Bacon, and in Miles Bridges. But Graham moves across to Brooklyn now to ostensibly be a backup behind uh, Damari Carroll, even though there is uh, Joe Harris there as well, and Karis LeVert, and Jan and Musa, and Rowdy Rodion's Kurix. I, I like what Graham can do, but I don't really see I don't really see him being a, a regular part of the rotation with some of those other guys that are there, or at least not getting big enough minutes to be a, a factor in uh, in many fantasy formats. Agreed. I, there's just too many guys on the wing there with the Nets for them to turn to. Um, it's good to have depth for the Nets, and it's another player for them to develop. It gives them another play to, player to turn to if they end up packaging several guys to facilitate a different trade or to make a, diff, uh, a trade for a, a, a legit core player to add to their roster. Um, but it's I don't think you're looking at Trevion Graham and expecting him to really exceed the, the 17 minutes that he averaged last year in 63 games for the Hornets. Yeah, there's just yeah, too many guys. I said Harris... Carroll, Musa, Kuroks. Not that those guys will necessarily play a huge amount, and Grain could be ahead of Kuroks and Musa. He's still going to be you know, probably third string at small forward with a you know, Levert mixed in there as well. So they're the, the recent transactions, Kyle. Uh, I think we'll, what we'll do is we'll put an end to today's show there with all that Kawhi letter news that took up the majority of it, and then uh, we'll come back and record some more stuff on your thoughts on Summer League and free agency, and you guys will get that podcast tomorrow. So, Kyle, thank you for coming on for part one of Josh Talks to Kyle podcast. Thanks, Josh. Before we leave, can you just do the uh, the uh, Mamba number five drop? One, two, three, four, five. There you go. Thanks, man. <laughs> Guys, make sure you are subscribing to this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, or on YouTube where you can go hit subscribe and leave a thumbs up. Follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Shout out to Jeff and Elliot. Actually, shout out to Jeff. My name is Jeff for uh, helping me with the Instagram page. I go and follow over there as well. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Jabari Parker.